thank you for, for making the time to come to this guy. Just ask quickly who was in my crazy PKI talk earlier today? Brilliant, okay. Maybe a small amount of slide reuse. I'll try and get through it as quickly as possible. Um, so my name's Robert Clark. I'm the lead security architect for HP. Um, I deal with all our security in the cloud. Um, Charles here from, is from Ericsson, and uh, I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more in a minute. Um, so I'm going to take a minute or two to talk to you very quickly about the OpenStack Security Group, uh, which we're both members of. The OpenStack Security Group has been around for two or three years now. Uh, we're responsible for uh, a whole bunch of different security initiatives inside of OpenStack. Um, if you care about security in OpenStack, if you really want to contribute to security in OpenStack, or if you just want a really good place to go and complain about the things that are horribly broken in OpenStack, then um, you need to come speak to us. Uh, so the um, security group's been responsible for a number of things. We've written a security guide. We produce uh, security notes, which are um, bits of security guidance around how best to deploy OpenStack in a secure way and will um, help steer you away from making bad configuration choices. Uh, we do threat analysis, which is the, um, the subject of this talk. Um, I'm going to let you all speak mainly about that. I'm going to introduce some um, security concepts and some of the ways in which, uh, as industry best practice, we can look at OpenStack code. So probably everybody here, probably not that many people that do threat analysis every day. So just going to touch on some of the principles there, look at a couple of vulnerabilities and how how the systems we use to appraise them would uh, would rank them in terms of their danger and in terms of the effect that they would have. And uh, then I'm gonna gonna pass the mic over, and uh, we'll run through some some of the threat analysis work that's been done already. So threat analysis really comes down to the management of three different properties around any type of data, any type of network connection, any type of interface, which is the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data. So whenever developers are building systems, we'd love to see these three things being considered. Um, a lot of the time, availability actually does get considered because everybody has to deal with large-scale problems in OpenStack. But often, confidentiality and integrity aren't. And when these things are missed, it becomes quite difficult to add them in later on. In a threat analysis context, it's, CIA is a little bit broad. So when we're trying to classify different types of attacks that we might see on a particular interface. We use a system called Stride. We didn't invent this. As far as I can tell, it was Microsoft in the um, secure development lifecycle. I'm happy to be corrected on that. But either way, it's been around for a long time. A lot of people use it. Stride consists of a number of different properties. And you apply consideration for each of these whenever you're building something. So spoofing can, can an identity be changed, can an identity be stolen or masqueraded. A um, good example of this, I have here a, a phone dialer where if you have a telephone number for a celebrity, you can dial into their voicemail because they use the telephone number that's dialing in as their authentication, and it turns out to be trivial to spoof. These are the sorts of things we need to think about when we're designing all systems, not just OpenStack, everything that you're going to build. Tampering with data. Um, so your typical man-in-the-middle type attacks can, can fit in here. Um, typical sort of coffee shop attacks where you're, you're messing around with people's data. Um, similarly, this is um, what a lot, of, a lot of secure transport tries to protect against. So if you're looking at building TLS, a lot of the time you're looking at building protections to people changing or observing data on the wire. Repudiation is important. So who changed what, when, and why. Um, you need to know when changes happened. You need to know who caused them to happen and why. Um, transaction information, you know, there is work going through OpenStack right now, but it's still not necessarily the easiest thing to map an API call that somebody made on a public interface to a file change that happened somewhere in Cinder or something like that. Information disclosure, so this is, uh, well, the system is caused to disclose information that it shouldn't otherwise do in any number of ways. Um, this can be as simple as misconfigured horizon interfaces. Um, so when you've left uh, configuration panels open and, and things like that, through to uh, your heart bleed, which we'll talk about in a minute, is actually an information disclosure vulnerability. It's just a really, really horrible one. Elevation of privilege, so any mechanism by which you can gain a higher level of privilege in the system than you were supposed to have by the designers. 
Um, in the case of OpenStack, this could be a failure in an API node to correctly evaluate you and allow you to execute things on the node that you shouldn't be able to. Um, in a hypervisor context, this could be a uh, hypervisor breakout where you've gone from having a level of access on a virtual machine to having a level of access on a compute host which you were never supposed to have. So again, stride. Um, one of the things you have to consider along with stride is um, exactly who's trying to attack your data. Now this lovely diagram is from the OpenStack security guide, which again, I encourage everybody to go and have a look at, find all the problems and email me, and then I'll pass them all on to Brian, and Brian will get them all fixed. Um, basically, when you're designing a system, you have to consider who's gonna try and attack it. And uh, everybody's familiar with the idea of a script kitty, someone that just downloads tools and runs them. Unfortunately, the reality is now that those tools are actually incredibly powerful. So you really have to worry quite a lot about the person even on the bottom rung. Above that, you have motivated individuals. These are people that understand what they're doing, may be capable of building some of their own tooling. Above that, highly capable groups of individuals. These are your typical sort of hacktivist types, um, people with an agenda who will come after you with some real force. Beyond that, you really get into serious organized crime and um, intelligence services, both foreign and domestic. Um, the line between those two used to be quite broad, and now it's very much less so. So serious, serious organized crime, we're really talking about a lot of Eastern mafias and, and how they're deploying malware into the world and, and where they're trying to gain point of presence and leverage. So we've spoken a little bit about, how to how, about the different types of interface and the different bits of systems that you need to evaluate using stride. Um, when you get to a vulnerability, or when you discover a vulnerability, hopefully before somebody else does, you need a way of actually establishing how, how important that vulnerability is. How much do you care about it? Is it going to be fixed in your next release cycle or do you need to go and unplug the internet immediately? Um, so DREAD is a simple scoring system. Damage potential, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. Low number, doesn't matter that much. High number, matters a lot. So what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about a couple of vulnerabilities you will be aware of. Uh, I've chosen three fairly high criticality ones, so I'm just going to quickly run through them. Um, so Heartbleed. Heartbleed who, so who here knows about, or who here was affected by Heartbleed? I assume everybody here knows about Heartbleed. Cool, okay. So a few people. Um, so Heartbleed was a vulnerability in OpenSSL to do with the uh, Heartbeat plugin, whereby uh, you could instruct the server to give you back more data than it meant to. The result was that you were getting memory that belonged to the web process that was running, uh, which meant that you could receive all bits of interesting information that were run in a web server. So these bits of information could be private keys that were used for the certificates could be session information from people logging in, or depending on your authentica authentication scheme, you could even just grab people's passwords out of memory. Now, this was really, really bad. Um, so it was actually only an information disclosure vulnerability. So on Stride, it you know, comes up under there. But also, because of how trivially you could get these pieces of information, there's a good case to be made that for it actually be a spoofing and elevation of privilege vulnerability as well. Now, the DREAD score comes out pretty high. It's very easy to find the vulnerability it's very easy to exploit it and happened on a pretty really reliable basis. So it comes out with a score of 4.1. 4.1 is a bad score. Anything red is bad. Anything above 4 is very, very bad. Um, so Heartbleed caused a lot of headaches for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people had to go and replace all their certificates. You have to upgrade their entire real estates. The <laughs> people had to ask themselves some very hard questions about what material they thought would be lost from their systems. It was a very bad vulnerability for a lot of people. So um, I presume everyone here heard about Shellshock. I love how vulnerabilities all have cool names now. OK, so uh, Shellshock was an interesting one, and that split the community a little bit. So this is really going to be my interpretation of how important Shellshock was. Shellshock allowed, in, in, br in broad terms, allowed you to define in inside environment variables functions that would be executed when the environment was evaluated. Um, what that meant was that you could do some very interesting things. Um, some of the first thing, for some of the first examples were that uh, people could abuse CGI servers. Now, if people are doing CGI pass through straight to shells, then they probably deserved a little bit of pain. But um, 
there were other interesting cases that came up. I mean, this was a really insidious vulnerability. Like uh, DCHP client, DCH, DHCP clients would uh, get some information back from a DHCP server, which isn't authenticated in any way. Um, and they would put that into environment variables when they were calling other parts on the system to set up a system when it first boots. Um, that was a really interesting way to uh, compromise an entire data center with one bad machine. Um, so this actually gets a very high dread score. And the reason I think it gets a high dread score is, well, the, the, the reasons are outlined, but the reason I think it ended up being slightly more important than Heartbleed is because it allowed you to subvert the system itself. Heartbleed was terrible, but all Heartbleed allowed you to do was recover credentials and then interact with the system in the way it was designed to be interacted with. If you grabbed credentials for a root user, that's really bad, but you're still interacting with the system by logging in as root and doing whatever it is that the system allows that user to do. Shellshock allowed you to completely subvert running systems in really dangerous ways, and it was really, really hard to work out what parts of your real estate were affected. You basically had to assume that everything that had Bash installed could be, a, could be compromised. Who here knows about XSA 108? Yeah. I think a few more people than raising their hands, perhaps. Um, who heard about Rackspace, sorry, and AWS, sorry, having to reboot large portions of their, clothes, their clouds a little while ago? OK, uh, that was because of this vulnerability. Um, it was very bad, allowed reading from memory from one guest to another and could cause them to crash and do all sorts of horribleness. Um, these vulnerabilities are really, really bad for us. I'm, I'm only bringing these out to demonstrate how we apply Stride and Dread primarily. Um, Charles is going to talk a lot more about different parts of OpenStack and how they fit together. Um, I just picked some exciting vulnerabilities from the headlines recently to kind of illustrate it. Um, it affected a huge number of customers. This is, this is your, as a cloud provider, this is your worst nightmare. As a cloud provider, this is my worst nightmare. Um, we weren't affected by this because we run KVM. I think everybody that runs a Zen-based cloud was probably affected in some way. Um, you know, we can't, I, we did a talk in, in Hong Kong on um, mechanisms you can use to try and contain hypervisor breakouts and, and, and control what people can do on the system. Um, if you're interested in that stuff, I can, I can send you a link to it. But uh, fundamentally, this is a really, really bad problem for cloud providers of all scales. Um, we need to continue to work upstream to improve our options with, with hypervisor and improve some of the security characteristics that they have by continuing to do threat analysis like this. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I just wanted to run through those, explain a little bit of stride and dread and how they can apply to different things. Um, encourage you all, if you're involved with designing stuff, if you're at the product level, consider confidentiality and integrity in your systems as well as availability how people are building things, what they're building them for, what sort of data is going to be stored inside it. Because it is much easier to des design this stuff in up front than to have to try and retrofit it afterwards. With that, I'm going to hand over to Shoal, who's done some amazing work on the threat analysis, all the threat analysis work he's led. Um, I've been on the sidelines kind of cheerleading with my OSSG flags. But uh, he's been leading all this stuff. And if you want to get involved, he's the guy to talk to. So I'll pass over now. Thank you. So we have started threat analysis work uh, almost uh, one year earlier when we see that OpenStack is uh, becoming one of the most popular platform to manage your cloud. And uh, we see that new de deployers, developers are coming up, and it's hard to know what's going on inside each of the OpenStack projects. So threat analysis is one tool that can provide any deployers the tool to understand what are the security issues from the from a big picture point of view. Uh, to go to, before going to the threat analysis, we will first uh, use the same categorization just uh, introduced by Robert and use it against historical security tag bugs, including the OSSS, which has been released, uh, against a target OpenStack project to understand that what internal components of a target project can be affected by, uh, by the weakness, security weakness, and what if there is some kind of pattern exist on those threads. So for our analysis, we have uh, taken Keystone, that is the OpenStack Identity API, and um, 
uh, Keystone middleware, which in conjunction with Keystone actually provides identity and access management solution for the whole OpenStack or different OpenStack projects. Uh, so let, let's look at this. So when you see uh, Keystone, Keystone is not just a one monolithic box. It's actually a combination of, uh, of different services inside. Um, and as you can see here, there are many components. So we, we picked up the major uh, services from the Keystone, uh, such as the identity assignment service, token service, and token controller, and so on. And for this analysis, we have taken um, 63 published already reported security bugs and try to map which internal components are prone to more security weakness. So as you can see here, some of the red colors on are more prone to security weakness compared to the blue and the green one. Uh, the same thing can be seen in using some bar chart where we can see there are some clear uh, cases for such as identity and assignment service for token controller, token service, so some cases get more security weakness uh, and due to the security weakness, some attacks and threats compared to others. Now what are the reasons for that? That's an, another investigation part, like why these things happen. Some of the components get more uh, security tech bugs compared to some others. Uh, maybe because they are, uh, they are quite like, they are introducing new features, because of that, but that's, that's a, another angle of the analysis which we could do, but we haven't done yet. Uh, from uh, another point of view is from all these uh, reported security bugs, what, uh, what are the consequences from these reported security bugs? Now, as you can see here, uh, most of them lead to spoofing of your identity. That means that someone else can pretend uh, as who you are. So which is actually quite a um, uh, serious thing. So most of the security bugs then lead to spoofing identity, and then the next one is related to information disclosure, and the third one is elevation of privileges. We also try to find out pattern from the historical data. Uh, so from this historical data, we find two major pattern of uh, weakness. One come from sensitive data exposure, in logging or output. So we have seen a whole lot of OSSN, OSSA, and security bugs related to such as uh, your token is written in the log file, your password is written in the log file, or someone is getting admin token using endpoint, like endpoint URL creating. So this sorts of weakness come uh, because of uh, input output filtering weakness um, in the project. Then the second class of pattern we see is related to revoked or expired token can be used uh, as, uh, as a valid token. Mm, so this is due to the fact that recently there are a lot of additions such as uh, adding of a domain as uh, ad addition of trust, so such as like when you invalidate a domain, you invalidate a tenant, invalidated a user or user changes password, you remove the trust. So in all those cases, tokens need to be revoked. And there are some mismatch happens and due to those mismatches, uh, we see that uh, uh, this security property that is revoked token uh, is uh, still used as a valid token. So this kind of security weakness come through. So, from this uh, historical analysis, we see that most of the threats are coming, or threats consequences are related to uh, spoofing of identity and information disclosure. And then the second category of uh, things that from here, we see some patterns are out there. The, most of the, the patterns are input, output, uh, filtering weakness, and access control weakness. We have also seen that uh, we, uh, like, from which sources this uh, weakness are generated. Is it because of some design fault, or is it because of implementation weakness, or is it because some crypto error? Uh, in most cases, is it, it is because of <coughs> implementation uh, failure. That's why these threats are generated. There are the second category is the design weakness, and the last one is the crypto error. It comes there. 
Now, this is all related to based on historical analysis. But hist from historical analysis, we can get a view of uh, where we can put more effort in future uh, and what type of things we should look in future uh, security weaknesses there. But to get an overall idea, we need uh, a comprehensive understanding of the system. And threat modeling can provide us a comprehensive understanding of the system. So when you say threat modeling, what does it mean? A threat is something which violates your security properties. So that is a threat. So what does it mean is like if you have a system or if an application where say you store a file and if someone can break that property, someone can like some user can access another user's file or he can store file in another directory, then it is breaking the system properties. So it creates a threat. So in threat modeling, we, in a systematic approach, we try to identify the threats to the whole system, identify attacks or successful attacks which can cause those threats. We identify the weakness related to the uh, related to the attacks, like which the attacker is actually exploiting. We identify the weakness uh, and also we identify the assets related to a particular attack that is attacker is targeting. For example, attacker can target the um, probably the token or attacker is targeting probably the user password. Uh, in the end, we also do the classification, try to find out the pattern. What is the pattern exists there? Um, and that gives a guidance that this type of things we probably need to look in future in our development phase. So for threat modeling, we usually follow a process. And in this case, uh, for this analysis, we have followed a six step process, which is uh, a simplified or adapted version um, we, from OSAP uh, analysis process they use there. Uh, we'll go through these things using uh, an example case which for which we have done it, one iteration of threat modeling for, that, for, the, for, for a target component. And in this case, we have used uh, Keystone middleware. Now, uh, so Keystone middleware is, uh, is the one that uh, actually you, you, uh, it is there in every OpenStack uh, service you, you use. So it's in the pipeline of your Nova, it's in the pipeline of your Glance. So what it does, it's a proxy that intercepts uh, any call it is coming and then from there it checks the token, it takes the token and then verifies the token, whether the token is correct or not. And if the token is correct, then it populates some more headers and let it pass through or block it there. So that it does there. So two main things the Keystone middleware does is it verifies that incoming client requests have valid tokens uh, uh, by communicating, communicating with, with the UID. Uh, in case of UID token, it communicates with the Keystone server. For PKI and PKIZ case, it just uh, checks the signature. However, there are some, uh, some other, actually some other sub-use cases are there. So even if your token is invalid uh, by these two main cases, if there is a delay authentication flux there, it can go a different path. Uh, if there are token caching is there, it can probably go some intermediate paths there uh, and so on. So from this uh, uh, thing, like what, what does the Keystone middleware provide? So what is the security guarantee it tries to provide. The security grant it provides is, is verifies the integrity of the token and it helps us to, uh, for, for access control. Now that's a, a high level understanding of Keystone middleware what it does. For threat modeling we also need to understand what are the internal components of, uh, of any, uh, any component are out there. So in this case this is a one level deeper uh, understanding of uh, Keystone middleware which we can see here is auth token is the main um, uh, component which is, uh, or subcomponent which is actually doing all the operations and then there are a lot of this dependent part that is such as HTTP request, hash lib, CMS, memcache scribe and so on. And then there are some interacting up and down side, there are some interacting uh, parties are there, that is the client side and INT APIs are there. You can also see that there are some dotted lines out here, so this dotted line actually interprets the trust boundary. 
So the trust boundary implies that uh, it, it creates a trust zone. So you trust everything within that zone, but you don't trust anything coming outside from the zone. So you don't trust anything coming from the client side when a client makes a request to the, this module inside OpToken module. So you don't trust anything coming from the client side. Similarly, probably if you want to place the lower uh, dotted line, then you don't trust anything coming from that side. But it depends on your setup and deployment cases. If you believe that your deployment case that, okay, I believe uh, the underlying configs are restored and memcache store are trustworthy, then I can remove it and we can then put it in one trust zone. So then we go for a detailed analysis. Um, uh, this is a deep dive, but we can then probably make those detailed analysis a simplified version. So this is a simplified version of, of uh, PKI token validation. Here you can see uh, there are major assets uh, in, in the green color, which are used during the, uh, during the verification or PKI token verification phase. And you can also see uh, the attacker, the attacker where the attacker tries to attack. The attacker tries to attack the client, attacker tries to attack the config file, the memcache, keystone server, and so on. So now uh, we have a pretty good understanding about, uh, about uh, the keystone middleware, what are the internal components, how the data flow is going through, what are the critical assets are there, and what is the attacker motivation here. The next thing is to identify the threats. That is what we are looking for. Now to identify threats, we have to look into what are the system assumptions and security controls, existing security controls in place for, for a component. Now say that we see that there are probably we trust, someone can trust the client and we, we, we just reduce that assumption. No, we will not trust the client. What becomes if a client becomes an attacker? It could be that we are someone thinks that the communication channel or tunnel uh, between the client and the Keystone middleware is trusted. So what happens if something goes wrong there? What happens, uh, uh, our uh, Keystone middleware is not uh, checking the CA certificate or the, it is not matching with uh, with the host name of the, of the certificate, which we've seen for, uh, uh, for HTTP lib 2 k So if those things happen, uh, what, what, how the scenario changes? What kind of threats can come from those scenarios? So the, the next step would be uh, to, to actually to have a guidance report, kind of like, like accumulate all the threats uh, from the analysis, and for this case, we have using or we are using um, like this kind of three-step model. So we first take one thread consequences. From the thread consequence, we identify what are the successful threads that can cause uh, this kind of consequences. And for each thread, we look for the attacks, like what successful attacks can cause the threat. So let's uh, look at an example. So we are taking a spoofing of identity and uh, that can be done by unauthorized access to the tar target service using a keystone middleware. So we are following a tree-like pattern. So how, how many ways you can do it? So you can do it probably multiple ways. One option could be attacker pass auth headers and the keystone middleware fails to remove the auth headers. Uh, and then we th need to think about, okay, is it a possible case? If it's not a possible case, we can just check it out. It's, it's a cross case. Then we take an another up path is like, okay, revoke token can be used as a valid token. It, so th this is a possible path and that then we can go dig down to another path is, okay, how that can be possible? Uh, it could be possible by attacker using a cache token and there is, uh, in, the, in the configuration file, you haven't set revocation forecast. So that can cause, within that opportunity window, a revoke token can be used in that, uh, in that opportunity window. Even if you set the revocation forecast token, it can be further one step down, where if the, your revocation list has been cached, during that time, the token can be, a revoke token can be used as a valid token. So that's one path. Now then we can go for another path. So another path is 
if we have a compromised revocation list, that can cause a revoke token used as a valid token. So how that can be possible? There are multiple ways that can be possible. Signing in compromised, we can assume that, okay, this will not happen, but then we can go for another path, which path says, okay, a stale revocation list is sent by a network attacker or a man in the middle attacker in between. So is it a possible scenario? So let's assume that it's a possible scenario. Why is it a possible scenario? Uh, if there are two security weaknesses exist in your system, in that case, it's a possible scenario. Uh, so one of the possible scenarios is, uh, one of the weaknesses needs to be there is uh, your server certificate validation from the Keystone middleware side is incomplete. So if there is a bug um, or if it is running in insecure mode, uh, in that case, the server certificate will not be validated or if new bugs that such as HTTP leap case comes where the CS certificate is not checked by the Python HTTP leap to libraries, in that case, it can happen. Then, uh, then the second weakness needs to be there is freshness check missing in the revocation list. That is, uh, you just create a revocation list, but it, there is no expiry time uh, for the revocation list or there is no counter exist to say that this is the fresh, current fresh list out there. So if these two weakness exist, in that case we can say that an attacker can create a replay attack or man in the middle attack and then, uh, then all the way down you can get an unauthorized access to the system. So but then again uh, we have to create uh, some or we have to give some scoring here, scoring about whether uh, it's a possible attack, what is the probability here? That's something we have to still have to work on how is the possibility of this such, such kind of attacks uh, in scenarios. So all in all, uh, a threat analysis can provide us a deeper understanding about the system, internal system, and um, it can give us a comprehensive view of the system. Uh, in sometimes it can feel like it's a lot of documentations um, and scaling of the work, how to, like if it's too much documentation, how can we work with the Open Stick Security Group, how to uh, actually um, implement it across different Open Stack projects that becomes sometimes challenging, which we are still working on uh, with the security group and then um, that's, uh, that's something we are, uh, we are still discussing. So yeah, that's, uh, I guess we can now take a uh, question or, yeah. So just before everybody leaves, I need somebody to give this man a camera for a second. So while you all think of the amazing questions you're going to ask, um, I'm also the chair for the security track at the security at the summit, and I think we've probably got good calls for another room as we're packed out through the doors every single time. So I need like Tim or Ben to give Joel a camera so he can take a picture from over here, or come over and take a picture of everyone that's here. Um, in the meantime, I want to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do to get the community involved in this. So the security group has been pushing threat analysis now for, I guess, coming up on a year, I guess we've been trying to make it an active project. It's very difficult to do because you need a lot of domain expertise. You need, we've been pushing a lot to get other people involved in OpenStack. So at HP, we do a lot of threat analysis work. Some of it is internal. We're trying to move more of it to be external. Um, other big players in OpenStack do the same sort of stuff. Um, people like uh, APL have a mandate to make OpenStack more secure. So there are people out there doing similar stuff. Obviously Ericsson as well, I should mention. Um, so if you have people who are concerned about security in OpenStack, or if you have people who are trying to do threat analysis work in OpenStack, um, we'd encourage you to, to come talk to us and see if we can do it in the open. See if we can um, start publishing the designs. I mean, the, the decomposition slide, the big scary one, um, that's where a lot of the work takes place, which is an unfortunate thing. I mean, threat analysis is hard, um, but there are enough people making enough money out of OpenStack that everybody sh can contribute a little bit to this and make it more secure. Um, you know, we're trying to push this into enterprise. We're building big, everyone's building big products based on top of it. Um, we need to try and come together on this a little bit more. So. I, I've asked at other summits and people have become more involved and um, I'm just asking again, if you're interested in this, if you're either getting involved or in contributing stuff you've already done, please come find me, find Shaul, find anyone from the OSSG and let, let's have a, a bit of a conversation about how to, how to do that. Okay, thank you.